God is faithful, God is good, and sometimes we don't notice that. Sometimes we get so caught up in focusing on what's happening in our lives that we don't understand that um, God's doing a, you know, writing a bigger story. He's painting a bigger picture. And sometimes we get so busy in other people's lives that we forget how good God has been to us. And so we're going to look together at Psalm 91. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 91. Uh, if you're a note taker and if you're a Bible reader, if you have a Bible app or a paper Bible here or at home, uh, you can go to Psalm 91 and kind of put your finger there and mark that, bookmark it in your phone, and then go to also 2 Thessalonians 3 and bookmark that because we're going to go back and forth and look at those two passages. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to have uh, a reading of Psalm 91, but I want you to kind of prepare to listen to the scriptures with a couple of thoughts. One is that in the ancient world, in Hebrew poetry, in the book of Psalms, is, is, are, are poetic in their structure. Sometimes the way God inspired the people to write fit right with how they wrote poetry in those days, there'd be the repeating of two lines that were saying the same thing, but they'd say it in different ways. That's called actually, that's called synonymous Hebrew parallelism. Want to say that together? No. Uh, but it's, it's these parallel structures where God is reinforcing the truth. So in, in a moment as you listen to the scriptures, I want you to hear that and then also hear about God's goodness and faithfulness. So I'm gonna ask our two readers to come and join me here. And I'm going to ask all of you, as you listen to the scriptures, to just let God speak to your heart. Think right now about how God has been good to you, how God has been faithful to you through the years. Maybe it's a time God's been good or faithful and you didn't even notice it, and today God wants to bring that to your mind and let you recognize his goodness. So just quiet your heart and listen to God's word. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your, at your side. 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling. No harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra and you will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Mm. Oh, living God, we come before you and we acknowledge that you have been good to us. There is a lot to celebrate in our lives, but we can miss it. So we pray that today you will open our eyes to recognize your goodness, our minds to comprehend your faithfulness, and our lives to celebrate and rejoice in all that you have done, all you're doing right now, and all you will do going forward. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Well, here's a question for you. What does celebration look like? What do you look like when you're celebrating? You saw on the screen a moment ago a sports team celebrating an amazing victory. Or a family celebrating the birth of a little one. There's lots of things in life to celebrate. Little things and big things. But there's a problem for many of us, if not most of us, if not at certain times, all of us. And that is we can miss God's goodness and miss his faithfulness. And there's actually a reason for that. There's a primary reason that we often miss the good things that God is doing. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about um, when you're raising kids. Sherry and I have three boys, and our boys are now all in their 30s. But they're always kind of, they're, they're, they continue to be two years apart from each other. It doesn't change. Uh, so, so like 35, 33, 31 now. So as they were, when they were little, one of Sherry's jobs, she felt this calling to, was to make sure they were treated fairly. So when we would do gifts or presents or something fun, it was, you know, I would just kind of do fun stuff, and she'd be like, but we need to make sure that the kids 
feel like they're treated fairly. So she would kind of, does anybody else do that? Does anybody like they kind of make sure that, you know, there's consistency there? And I was thinking about that. Uh, I think about a family in the church here who's been in this church for many, many years, uh, and they have actually have quadruplets. And so uh, they had four, the same two boys, two girls at the same time. They were actually sitting, uh, 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 Robert and Jeannie were sitting right there the last service. And as I was talking about this, they were kind of nodding their heads and smiling because then other kids are adults now and grown up. But I was thinking about when a special occasion comes, if you have quadruplets, when our boys were little, we could kind of say, well, you know, he's one, you're three, or he, you know, you're three, he's seven. It could be a little different. But when they're quadruplets, it has to be pretty consistent across the boards. All right? And so, so I thought about this, and I thought about special holidays. And the other day, I was walking into one of the, uh, you know, CVS, Walgreens, all of them, look, they kind of look the same, one of those kind of stores. And I found out that they follow the church year. They were celebrating Easter already. Because today's Lent, the beginning of a 40 days leading into Easter. So they're celebrating, but they're not celebrating with the resurrection of Jesus. It's candy. So I walked in, and I was like, oh, that's right. Easter's coming because there was all this candy. And I noticed among the candy, I wasn't looking that closely. I just happened to walk by and notice. But, uh, but they had these robin's eggs. You know what robin's eggs are? They're these, they're these guys here, right? And so it's, it's like malted milk in the middle. Then it's covered with chocolate. Then it has a hard candy outside shell. Terrible stuff. Stay away from it. Uh, but so I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine uh, Robert and Jeannie Ward with with their quadruplets, and they're giving out candy on Easter. So they go to the first of their little girls, and they count out. Here's ten robin's eggs, and she's excited. She's, oh, it's candy. She's all excited. She's, throwing, she's holding, it's, don't, don't eat them yet, but just kind of hold on to them. So she's got her, her 10 robin's eggs. Then they go to the next girl. One, two, three, four, 10 robin's eggs. She's all excited. They go to the, the, the next, the, to the boy. 10 robin's eggs. And they're all just like, they, can we eat them now? They're all so excited. And then they go to the last one and they give the rest of the bag that has 150 robin's eggs in it. <laughs> we have a problem in the household right now, don't we? Now, here's the thing. The first three were all excited and happy. Until what? Inequity, right? There's a problem here, right? Can I tell you right now, before we really dig into this passage and the reality of God's goodness and God's faithfulness, you will never learn to celebrate the goodness of God if you spend your time looking at what somebody else, how many robin's eggs somebody else has. Because there's always somebody with more robin's eggs, a nicer house, a bigger car, uh, whatever. You, know, you, you fill in the blank. There's, you will always find somebody, if you're looking at them, oh, mine's terrible. But if you look at what, at what you have and what God's given to you and, and his goodness, and you keep your focus here, you'll learn to say, God is good. God is faithful. Because I'm not here to compare what someone else has to me. I'm here to recognize the goodness of God in my life. So I want to ask you, as we begin this time in God's word together, to really make a decision. That, because some of you say, well, God isn't good, God isn't faithful, because I don't have what someone else has. And all of a sudden, we're you know, five or six years old, and people are doling out robin's eggs, and it's not fair. But if we recognize God's goodness, man, there's such a place for joy. And so we're going to look together at, at Psalm, uh, Psalm 91, and we're going to learn from, from what God says about himself and what the psalmist says about God. And the first thing we're going to learn is this. We can be, God is good, God is faithful, because he is my shelter and my rest. When you recognize that God is your shelter and God is your rest, you can say, and I'm going to have you echo it after me, you can say, God is good. Someone wants to say it all the time. See that? <laughs> I say God is good, you echo it. God is good. And if you mean it, each time I say it, I want you to say it with me. God is good because he shelters us and he gives us rest. Psalm 91, 1. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. When you walk close to God, when you know that he knows you and loves you, when you come to the cross and meet Jesus, he shelters you. He watches over you. He offers green pastures, quiet waters, places of rest. We're going to spend three weeks talking about this in the Unplugged series, which will be starting in two weeks. But I just want to encourage you to, in the next two weeks, watch yourself. Watch your life. Do you find places of rest? Do you find places of quiet? Or do you just feel like wound up all the time? It's like, even when I'm relaxing, I'm tense. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I can't, I can't even relax when I'm relaxing. If you find yourself like that, begin praying. Say, Lord, these, these three weeks coming up, open my heart to how I can unplug from certain things and plug into the things that bring peace and rest inside and to our lives. So a question for you. What can I do to seek shelter, rest and shelter in the God who made me? 
What can I do to just quiet myself and find a place of rest? And, and there's an image in the Bible, in the Gospels, where, where you have a person, Mary, who's sitting at the feet of Jesus while her sister Martha's running around doing chores and running. And she's, her, her sister's actually getting upset that the other sister is actually just sitting at the feet of Jesus. But there's a place where you can just say, say Jesus, I need to be with you. I need to be quiet. I need to actually breathe. Some of you haven't taken a deep, slow breath in days, weeks, months, or years. And to say, God, teach me to slow down. Teach me to rest. Teach me to find places of quiet. So again, we're going to dig into that in the coming weeks. And we're going to linger there in depth. But I want you to know that the scripture says that God creates places for you to know that he shelters you and he offers you rest. And then the psalmist goes on and tells us this, that God is my refuge and my fortress. My for this is a sense of, of absolute protection. If you know that God is your refuge and your fortress, you can say, I'm going to say it, you repeat it, God is good. When you know he's your refuge, when you know he's your fortress. So Psalm 91 verse 2 says this. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in whom I trust. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, if you bookmark that, kind of toggle over or flip over to 2 Thessalonians 3. And in verse 3 we read this. But the Lord is faithful. And he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. He will protect you from the evil one. God being your fortress, God being your refuge, God being your protector, acknowledges that there's a battle going on. There's a, a real spiritual battle in a real spiritual world. If you believe that God exists, you also have to understand that the enemy exists. There's an enemy of your soul who wants to mess with you. He wants to twist you around and steal your joy, and steal your rest, and steal your peace, and have you live your whole life consumed with things that don't honor God. And, and so God says, I will, be, I will be the one who is your refuge. I will be your fortress from the attacks of the enemy. Now, I wasn't exposed to things like spiritual battles and spiritual warfare. There's a battle going on, and God is on the throne. He's won the battle. He's won the victory, but there's an enemy in this world who's still trying to fight against us. I wasn't exposed to that because I didn't grow up in the church. When I became a Christian, I was part of a church that didn't talk about that kind of stuff very much. Didn't talk about spiritual battles. Didn't talk about the spiritual enemy. The church I became a Christian, they preached the gospel. They loved Jesus, but they didn't talk about that. And I didn't encounter it until I encountered it. And I encountered this reality at a camp called Forest Home. It's actually the camp where Billy Graham felt his call to ministry. And we went up there. I'd been a Christian for about two years. And I was actually now just out of high school. And I was a volunteer working with a bunch of high school kids. And this one high school kid who came to the camp was not a Christian at all. Grew up in a home with a lot of addictions. His brother was a drug dealer. Very rough environment. And this guy came up to this Christian camp. But he was not a Christian, and he was kind of hanging back and watching stuff, but kind of getting involved, but kind of hanging back, which is totally fine. People come at their own pace. But the last night of the camp, they had, they had a music going on. There was going to be a message about Jesus, and people would have a chance to receive Jesus. And I was looking for this guy. He wasn't with our, with our youth group. There was youth groups from a bunch of different churches up at this big camp, and he wasn't with our group, so I went to kind of find him. And he was sort of standing at the edge of the room, almost outside the door, at the edge of the room. So I went just to say, hey, come on, join our, you know, come with the rest of the youth group. Come join us. And I walked over toward him, and the only way I can describe it is he looked at me with terror in his eyes, and then with, like, hatred in his eyes, and then he tried to talk, and he couldn't talk like somebody had grabbed his throat and was choking him, but there was nobody choking him. And so, was, and again, I didn't grow up with this stuff, and I wasn't exposed to this, but, but here's the trick. I had read the Bible already, and I had read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the story of Jesus, and I would learned that there are spiritual battles that go on. I didn't know how all that worked. I just knew it was true because the Bible teaches it. So this guy tried to talk to me. It was like he was being choked. He turned around and he ran away. So I grabbed a couple people and I just said, start praying now. And I went running after him. I went down the hall. I can still picture it like it was yesterday. And this is, I was like 18 years old. And he went running down the hall, turned left and kind of disappeared. I went down the hall, chased him, turned, and he had gone into a bathroom. I walked into the bathroom and this young guy, he was 16 years old at the time, is in the corner like a trapped animal just trembling when I came near him, he started to like, you know, kind of speak pretty badly. And, I, and so at that point, I didn't, again, I didn't know what to do. I just looked at him and I said, and again, no official training. I just, I just said like, knock it off and leave him alone and get out of him. And Satan, you're bad. Get, and I didn't like, didn't have official churchy words. I just kind of like said, knock it off, you know. And this guy just passed out and dropped on the ground like he was dead. And they went and got the nurses. The nurses came in, got him. And about two hours later, 
when they, when they brought him back, um, he said for like the previous day and a half, there were voices telling him to kill me, to kill other people, to go on the stage and do horrible things, to say terrible things, all these voices talking to him. And that night he decided it was time to accept Jesus because he had seen the other side, right? And he prayed to receive Jesus. And actually I said to him, I said, listen, I said, you need to start memorizing parts of the Bible so that when, I said, I said now that you're a Christian, the, Satan can't get inside of you, but he can still attack you from the outside. And he'll try to. So I said, you should start memorizing the Bible. Just some passages. And he said, well, he had actually, when he was younger, he had thrown a knife against a wall that came back stuck in his head. And he had a speech impediment after that and a memory loss problem because of that. And he said, I don't memorize things very well. But I said, well, just try to find like one or two verses. He went on to memorize, I think it was 23 chapters of the book of Proverbs. Yeah. I'd, I'd just say to him, hey, uh, Proverbs chapter seven. He'd say, the fool says in his heart. And it was all there. <laughs> and his life was changed. But, but, it, but it began with the reality of this battle, this spiritual battle. And I, I just want to say to you that, that God, God is your refuge. He is your fortress. The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. When you put your faith in Jesus, if you're a Christian, when you put your faith in Jesus, you come to the cross, confess your sins, receive Jesus. The spirit of God moves into you and the enemy cannot move into you anymore. He can't possess you, but he can attack you and oppress you from the outside. And so stay close to Jesus. He is your refuge. He is your fortress. He's already won the victory. Amen? Amen. But understand, there's, there's battles going on. And so the thing about Psalm 91 is it's not saying everything always goes your way and you never have a problem when you follow God and when you walk in Jesus. What he's saying is you walk in the victory. You walk in his protection. So stay close to Jesus and walk with him. Get under the cross and then walk in the power of the cross of Jesus and all that you do. So the question is, how can I run to God when the enemy attacks? How do I learn to run to God? Because we all, you know, think about it. Matthew chapter four, Luke chapter four, those two chapters of the Bible are when Jesus, God in human flesh, is on this planet and the enemy tries to attack him. So if you, if you think that you won't come under attack, well, if, they, if the enemy would try to attack Jesus, he'll probably try to attack us. So be ready and stand strong. But how do I run to God when the enemy attacks? Well, do what Jesus did. Have scripture in your heart and your mind. When Jesus was attacked, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Talk to Jesus, ask for his power. Acknowledge where you feel the attack coming and say, God, give me strength. Find Christian friends who you love and trust who will pray for you and stand with you against the enemy. But understand that there's a battle going on and you can stand strong in the presence of Jesus. Sing worship songs, talk with you. just the power of the name of Jesus. Say the name of Jesus with authority and has power in your life. And then the psalmist goes on and we learn this, that he is my salvation when I need salvation, when I need saving from sin, but from anything, he is my salvation. When you know that God is your salvation, you can declare, get ready to declare it, you can declare God is good. God is good. Why? Because he saves us. He offers salvation for us. Look at Psalm 91, verses three and four. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you, I love this picture, he will cover you with his feathers. And under his wings, you will find refuge. That's just a word picture to say that God surrounds you and watches over you. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. He offers more than protection. He offers salvation, saving power in Jesus to save you from your sins, to save you from yourself, to save you from other people, to save you from temptation, to save you from all things. So say, God, be my savior. And, it, and let me tell you, if you've never come to the cross, You've never received Jesus. You've never confessed your sin and say, I'm gonna follow Jesus. He is as close as a prayer. And if you, if you say, man, I've never, you know, I, I wanna walk in his salvation. I wanna walk in his protection. I would say, if you've never done that, talk to myself or one of the pastors today and say, listen, I've never come to that place where I've actually accepted Jesus. And I wanna pray to receive him today. I need that power. I need his presence in my life. So here's a question. Why is it so important that we remember the saving work of Jesus over and over again? Why do we need to remember that Jesus saves again and again and again? Why do we meet the first Wednesday of every month and break the bread and drink the cup and have communion together? Why? To remember the salvation that comes in Jesus, the price he paid for us. We need to remember it because we forget who we are. We forget that we've been washed clean and that we're saved. If you've come to the cross and received Jesus, whether you were, whether you were five years old like Sherry was, whether you were 15 years old like I was, whether you were, we, we had people... Uh, two weeks ago, make commitments to Jesus here. And we have, we have people sometimes in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s make a first-time commitment to Jesus. We have to remember what he's done. He saved us. 
And so come, come back to that again and again and again. And you know what? The enemy can come to you and try to take things away. The enemy will try to take things away from you. And, and life take things, takes things away from you. If, if you have this idea, if I become a Christian, everything's smooth sailing, everything's easy all the time, you're not reading the same Bible I'm reading. There's challenges. The difference is your salvation no one can take away. I'm at a time in life where I'm recognizing that you start losing things when you go through life. I'll give you a very practical concept. I can't drive a golf ball as far as I used to. I'm, I'm turning 60 this year. I still hit it pretty far for an old guy. But, I'm, but you know, I, I, you go, okay, well, I, you lost something. Yeah, that's okay. We, we can lose financial resources in this world. We can lose friendships. You know what you can't lose? If you come to the cross, you cannot lose your salvation. If you've come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, he moves in. And the way Jesus says it in John chapter 10 is he says, you're in my hand, you're in my Father's hand, and no one can snatch you away, not even yourself. Why do I have to remember our salvation? Because that's the one thing no one can ever take away from us. And here's the good news, and that lasts forever. You know, that, that goes on eternally. So we have to remember the gift of God's salvation. And then you continue on. You continue on in this beautiful psalm, Psalm 91. And you discover he is my confidence. Man, do people need a little confidence in our world today? People, so many people with all that's gone in the last couple of years have lost a lot of confidence. But when you walk with Jesus, you can walk in confidence. If you know you can walk in confidence, you can declare, get ready to repeat it, and you can declare, God is good. God is good. Amen. You can say, so look at Psalm 91, 5 to 8. You will not fear the terror of night. There's confidence, right? You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day nor pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Saying this, the world's crazy. Stuff goes on. This isn't saying nothing goes on. It's just saying you don't have to walk in fear of it. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. And then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, that theme of confidence. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. Here, the church members are saying, we have confidence in the Lord that you'll keep following him. You'll keep walking with him. You'll keep doing what God commands. There's a confidence because God is present. God is near. You don't have to walk in fear. You don't have to walk consumed by anxiety. Now, I understand there's, there, there, is, there is help for people that are dealing with psychological challenges, physiolog physiological challenges. Those are real things. But at the end of the day, in your heart of hearts, you don't have to live your life in fear and anxiety and worry all the time. And, and so many people do. But you can walk in a confidence that God is with you, that he watches over, that you know you're walking and you're never alone. And so, and so get the help you need and talk to a great Christian counselor and deal with the physiological things. If you have chemical imbalances, I'm not speaking against that, but I'm saying in the midst of all of that, you can have all those things to help you and still live in constant paralyzing anxiety and fear because you forget who you walk with and who you are if you're a follower of Jesus. And you have to remember that. And since we always have new people at show, and you might have heard me sh share this before. I, I saw this years ago, and it's never left me, and so I'm going to share this one more time. There's a guy, Ken Davis, Christian comedian, Christian speaker and comedian. And he made this, he did kind of this, did this uh, drawing, this painting, and then had somebody make it on a T-shirt for him. And I want to paint the picture for you, because I love this picture. And it gives a great perspective when it comes to fear and anxiety and worry. So here's the picture. The picture is a little lamb. But it's like a cartoon lamb. And the little lamb is standing up on his hind legs, walking kind of like a little lamb kind of person. So it's kind of walking along, this little lamb's walking along, and it's in the middle of this valley. And on both sides of the valley are wolves and lions. Like along both sides of the valley. And this little lamb's walking down the valley with wolves and lions. And all the wolves and lions, their eyes are like this glowing beady yellow. Their teeth are sharp and salivating. And they're looking at this little lamb, and all they're seeing is one thing. Lunch. Right? And there's a little word bubble over the head of this little lamb. But that's not the whole picture. Walking next to the lamb is Jesus. And he's, and he's uh, kind of a superhero Jesus, big, strong Jesus. He's got the Jesus look and got the Jesus robe, but like, more like a like superhero Jesus. And, and Jesus holding the lamb's little hoof hand kind of thing, and they're just walking together down the valley with all the wolves and the lions there. And over the, the little word bubble over the lamb's head is this. He's pointing his little hoof and at Jesus and he says, I'm with him. <laughs> and that's it. I know who I walk with. I know how the story ends. 
Because I read it. Have you peeked ahead to the book of Revelation? There's a throne. And there's a king. And sin and hell and the enemy are vanquished and thrown in the bottomless pit. And God rules and reigns. And if you are his child, you rule and reign with him forever and ever and ever. And when stuff comes at you, you remember you're walking with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He has your hand. He's with you. And you are never alone. He is good and he is faithful and he loves you. What has God done in the past that makes you confident in his faithfulness for the future? It's good to remember the past so you can look forward to the future. When I, in my life, when I stop and just look back and see all the dumb things I did God protected me from, all the, the steps I made that I could have just torpedoed so many things, I see God being faithful again and again. I look back and I remember God's faithfulness for the future and God leading me forward. And then the psalm continue, continues on and we learn this, that he, God, is my protector. And whatever I face, he's with me, he takes my hand, he protects me. If you knew that God was with you and protecting you all the time, you could say, let's try it out, you could say, God is good. good. You can declare that with all your heart. Psalm 91, verse nine. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, you recognize he's with you, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, you dwell and live in the presence of God, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. That God will put angelic beings watching over you. You may never see them, but God is more there than you realize. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. And then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. There's battles going on. And you will face them. You'll face them in your workplace. You'll face them in your schools. Sometimes you'll face them in your own family. You'll face them in your neighborhood. You'll face them in social settings. But you'll hold on to Jesus. And you'll walk with Jesus. And you say, Jesus, protect me. Watch over me. So I'm going to ask you to do something. We're not done with the message. I have one more key thing to share from this passage. But I want to pause and pray. And I want to ask this question. Where do you need God's protection today, right now? And we're going to ask for it. Where do you need, I mean, think about your life. Maybe it's over your kids or grandkids. Maybe it's in a relationship, maybe in the workplace. Maybe it's, I, I don't know, but just think, where, where do I need the protection of God right now? And join me in praying for that. Come before God right now. Say, God, you know my life. You know what I'm facing, what's facing me. You know where I need your protection. So I come to you, Jesus, right now. And I recognize and declare that you crushed the power of sin and you crushed the power of death and you crushed the power of hell and the enemy when you rose from the dead. I put my trust in you. I put my confidence in you. So Lord Jesus, protect me. And now would you pray to him and say this. And Lord, if there's things I need to do to help with that protection, choices I need to make, actions I need to take to be part of that protecting work, God, I will do my part. I'm not going to keep running away from you and expect you to protect me. I'm going to run towards you and with you and take your hand. Lord, protect us in our places where there's attack and struggles. Lord, we all have them. Show yourself faithful as you protect us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And the last thing from the passage I want to look at is that he is my greatest love. Do you understand that that if you want to walk and understand the goodness and the faithfulness of God, understand that he can be the one you love the most and understand how precious you are to him. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. At your worst, most rebellious moment, God loved you so much, he gave his only son for you. Think about that. In your worst moment, before you wanted Jesus, before you cared about Jesus, before you tried to clean yourself up and make yourself better, God said, I love you so much, I will give my only son for you. He is my greatest love. And if God is your greatest love, you can declare with all your heart, God is good. Because he loves us and we can love him back. Psalm 91, 14 to 16. And here God is speaking. Notice the voice of God in this passage. Because he loves me, says the Lord. He's talking about you because, because he, because he or she, because you love him. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. 
He will call on me, and God says, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, God says, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. In 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 5, we read this. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. May God direct you toward his love and toward his perseverance. And, and so we, we walk in that love, and we acknowledge that, that God has loved us before we loved him. Now, try to get your brain around this, because I, I know what the enemy does in our hearts and our minds. When you first come to the cross and receive Jesus, many of you are Christians. Some of you are not yet Christians. But when you come to the cross and you confess your sins and when you receive Jesus, there's this overwhelming sense, I'm forgiven, I'm loved. God knows everything about me and he loves me. That's part of that first moment. Then we start walking down the road, walking with Jesus and, and years go by and decades go by. And we start to believe the lies of the enemy. So you mess up and you struggle in some area of your life. And we all do. And the enemy whispers, God doesn't love you anymore. You're terrible. You think that God loves you. Look at what you did. But think about this. If God loved you when you were at your worst and didn't care about Jesus, how much does he love you when you're trying to follow him even though you stumble sometimes, right? God is crazy about you. He loves you. He delights in you. And you can delight in him. And then when you walk with him and love him, his love so fills you, it overflows to other people and they experience the love of God. That's what we do. We, we're people so filled with the love of God that everywhere we go, it overflows. And we share his love with others. That's the heart of God. That's the love of God. So every day, we can declare, I am loved by God. Here's my closing question. Do you live each day dwelling in God's love and sharing it with others? Do you live each day just saying, God, I, I recognize with all my frailties, with all my mixed up ways, you love me. So Jesus, this is our prayer. This is our prayer today, whether we're online, whether we're on campus somewhere here. We turn our hearts to you and we say, oh God, remind us of the greatness of your love for us. That while we were sinners and rebels, you loved us and you died on the cross for us. That you, Jesus, who never sinned, who knew no sin, you became sin so that we could become right, become the righteousness of God. So Lord, let us walk in the reality of your love. When we know how much you love us right where we are, we will understand your goodness and your faithfulness. And then, oh God, fill us with your love so much that we can love you back and let your love overflow everywhere we go. Oh Lord, let your love overflow on our school campuses, in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, everywhere we go. Let your love overflow at all times and in all places. God, you are good. God, you are faithful. God, you are with us right now. So Lord, we respond by declaring your goodness. Hear our hearts and hear our praise.